We're going to talk about the doctrine of eyes again today. This will be our second part. I want to answer some questions about the doctrine of eyes. As you know, this is a basic, fundamental teaching of the fourth way. If you don't understand this, you're not going anywhere in the in the fourth way. You're not going to understand anything about the fourth way. So you may ask yourself, what is an I? And the reason you may ask yourself this is because it's a difficult concept. The whole idea that an I is a personality, a small individual personality inside of you, a small being with intellectual, emotional, and moving part. The idea that they are real people in us is a difficult concept for our minds to accept. And what makes it difficult is we can't think of a person outside of a body. You think of a person, you see their face, you see their body, you think of that. And so when I say it's a small being, a small person inside you, you think, well, what, am I possessed by little people inside me? How can a little person be inside me? Is this like the fantastic voyage where they shoot a little miniaturized submarine into the bloodstream and it goes, remember that movie, and it goes through the body? Is it like that? Well, no, but you see, you have to, we have to disconnect our minds from the outer world. And this is the most difficult thing in the fourth way, because we're so attached to the external world through our senses, our entire thinking process is based on that. And now what we're trying to do is shift to another place where we think so differently an internal thinking so that we, we start to see things esoterically. We start to see things the way the mind works, not the way the false personality works, not the way the senses work, but in a different world, a different universe, a different paradigm where symbols are used instead of things that we have out here. Now, we have things out here. You look at my face, and that's a symbol of me to you. But the problem is, is that we are so identified with the symbol, we can't disconnect from that and see that what we are seeing is not really who the person is. It can't be. How could it possibly be? Because you change. Your face changes all the time. But you, who you are, remains the same. That's what we think, anyway. We think that we remain the same. Of course, we don't. Nothing remains the same. Everything's changing. But we can't tolerate that, so we won't accept that. That doesn't fit in our paradigm. So this is why we need a different one. The idea that these eyes are real people inside of us, try and get away from the idea that they're little bodies, like Gulliver's Travels in the, the land of the Lilliputians. Try and get away from that and move into this idea that there are little compact individual personalities that live inside of you, that they're actually different personalities. Now, the reason you can't grasp this is because it takes a long, long time and a lot of sincere self-observation to ever identify an individual eye. What we identify instead and call individual eyes are groups of eyes. That's the best we can do. We can find a group of eyes and we can identify that and call that an eye. It's not an eye, it's a group of eyes. For example, Steve is Tammy's husband, but Steve is also Joshua, Lydia, and Deborah's father. So Steve has a group of eyes that are father eyes, a group of eyes that are husband eyes, a group of eyes that are social eyes. Steve has friends. His friends get to see one group of eyes. It goes to make up like a personality. One of the ways of saying this is, well, people wear different hats in life. This is my professional hat. This is what I wear. Now, we know because Matt goes to work, he dresses differently than he's dressed now. He comes here, he dresses like this. He's kind of like laid back surfer boy. Shorts, barefoot, t-shirt. People who know him from the beach, from surfing, they know Matt in a wetsuit with a surfboard and his black Santa Fe with the surfboard rack on top. So they know that. People at work know an entirely different personality. So this is the concept. Now what the work teaches is that these personalities are actually living inside of us. So even when we're not connected with the personality that's doing whatever it is it's doing, fathering, husbanding, working, socializing, even when we're not connected, those personalities are there and they are living. They have their own lives in there whether we know it or not. For example, Connie's not here today. She's traveling somewhere. But she's having a whole life right now while I'm doing this. So while I'm using my professional eyes 
group of professional eyes to do what I'm doing. Her life is going on without my awareness of it. The same thing is happening in you. There are groups of eyes and their life is going on without you. Now that's closer. Yes, it's scary, isn't it? That's closer to what this idea that I presented last week is about. So this is why I'm saying we may ask the question, what is an eye? We need to get a firm grasp of this and have a real understanding of this because this is a basic principle. Without this, you're nowhere. You're going to wander around in the weeds for the rest of your life thinking that you know what I'm talking about, thinking that you know what the work teaches, thinking that you're actually observing yourself. When the truth is, you're just beginning. But until you get this concept, you don't even know what to observe. So we're not observing single eyes, we're observing groups of eyes, we're calling them single eyes. Well, I have an eye that says, what you have is, a, is so many eyes inside that are screaming that, that it sounds to you like one eye. You see a picture from a satellite of the Earth, and you see green, and you see blue, and you say green, okay, that's vegetation, and you see blue, and you say, okay, that's water, and you see the white spots everywhere, and say clouds. Now, that's good. You can see that. But as you move in closer, you see that the vegetation is not just green, it's trees and plants, and it goes on and on and on. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to say, instead of green, blue, white, vegetation, water, clouds, we're trying to see deeper. We're trying to move inside more and more. And that's where real self-observation begins. As Pensky said, you all think eyes are not real. You think they're theoretical. I assure you they are quite real and live in the house of your own being and continually control you. And this is the scary part. Yes, Connie is wherever she is in the United States right now, living her life. And I know nothing about it. I have no clue what she's doing. I can imagine I know that she's teaching a seminar to a group of women on painting. I can imagine that, but I don't have any idea, really. I don't know. That's just what I imagine. Who is imagining that? I have no idea. I don't even know where that comes from. It's just imagination in there. They're just eyes that say, oh, yes, I know. I know. And they don't know anything. But we accept that I know, I know, as if it were me. We give it validity by saying, that is me. That voice that is going in my head right now is me, when it's not you at all. And that is what this teaching is about. That's not you. And until you can learn how to inter-separate from that, how you can separate from that and not identify with that, they control you. The work parable about this is the parable of the house in disorder. So there's this house, and in this house, all these people are living, but they're servants. They're all servants. So the master of the house, think of an old English mansion the lords used to have. And the master of the house, he'd go away, but the servants all stayed there. What was that movie with Anthony Hopkins? Remains of the day. Excellent example. The lord of the house was gone. Lord, whatever his name was, he was gone. But they still had a staff, a full staff of servants. And the butler, the head butler, he was in charge of everything. The problem with us is when the master is gone, and the master is real I, who you really are, your essential I, who you really are, is gone. You don't know who that is. You don't know where to find it. You think you do. But the truth is, and it's a verifiable truth, you can prove this by looking at your life. Anyone who looks at their life from this perspective, through the work, will see very clearly that they are not in charge of their lives. Anything can happen. Somebody comes into this room and starts to yell at them, and they have no control over what they're going to do. They will react in the only way that they can react, and they don't even know what that'll be. Well, what will happen if you get in an automobile accident on your way home from here? Well. It, I'd be very upset. Well, you might be. Well, I might get hurt. Yes, you might get hurt. But you don't know. And that's how we are. We don't know how we react until it happens. And then we don't usually know how we reacted because we immediately start filling in with imagination and twisted memory. This really happens. Talk to any insurance adjuster about someone. To, they'll say some of the most fantastic stories we've ever heard were from people who got in accidents. For example, one person said, I said, well, what happened? Well, I was driving down the street, and I came to this, this intersection, and this car came from nowhere and hit me. Well, that person really believed that. That person really believed that a car came from nowhere. Cars don't come from nowhere. They come from the street. They come from this direction or that direction. What the person really meant was, 
Well, I was so inattentive and unaware, I didn't even see the car that hit me until it hit me. And now I still don't know what it was. All I know is that a car hit me. At least I think a car hit me. I may have hit a car. But we are so vain and proud, we could never admit that. To say nothing of the repercussions of, well, the insurance company is good. We have to lie. People feel instantly that they have to lie. Well, I have to lie or else the insurance company is going to blame me. And if they blame me, then my insurance rates will go up. It'll cost me money and I don't want to pay it because we have eyes in there that are terrified that we won't have enough. They're into scarcity. So whole groups of eyes, survival eyes, that all they care about is lying so that they can keep themselves alive, keep more money. They're terrified of starving to death or dying or not having enough or not paying the rent or not paying the bills or not being able to go to the movies or whatever. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're starting to get an idea of what this insanity that we're living in. This is the house. The house is you. We are a house. This is the parable of the house in disorder. We are this house. The master's gone. The person who is supposed to run the house, who gives the orders, he's gone. We've forgotten who he is. We descended into this world of external things through our senses, and we have forgotten the internal world and who is actually running this. We've got to get back to that. This teaching is how to get back to that. That's what this is about. How to get back to the place where real I is. He's waiting for you, above you, which means internally, deep within you. Real I is there. But we've forgotten how to get there. We've lost our way. And we lost our way because we were out here following breadcrumbs to all the goodies, like Hansel and Gretel. We followed the wrong trail. And then we turn back and look, and all the breadcrumbs are gone. They've been eaten up by the birds, and we're lost. That's our condition. That's our state. The doctrine of eyes is something we need to understand if we're going to get out of this condition, if we're going to find our way back to real eye. In other words, back home. So there's no master. But each eye goes to the phone. So there's a phone in the house. Each eye goes to the phone. He picks up the phone and he dials and he calls the grocery store. So one eye gets it and he calls the grocery store. Well, this is a drunkard eye. And he says, send out this many cases of wine. This is master blah, blah, blah of the house of blah, blah, blah and blah, blah, blah lane. Send out this many cases of wine and this many cases of whiskey and this many cases of beer. Send those right now. Deliver those right now. The person on the other side says, okay. And he hangs up the phone. Then somebody else picks up the phone and calls a different store and says, I want you to send out a tailor to fix uh, suits for me or whatever. And then another eye comes along and he calls somewhere else and he says do this and another eye comes and he calls somewhere else and says do that and they're all doing it in the name of the master who is gone so the house is in total disorder so who is supposed to keep these eyes in charge well he's not there so the head butler is even gone the head butler is gone he's on vacation he left and the person who usually runs the kitchen that person has decided well I, I think I'd rather garden so that eyes out gardening and the gardener well he said yeah I'm hungry I'm going to the kitchen so he starts cooking and he doesn't know anything about cooking. All he knows is about is gardening. And the eye that's out there gardening knows about cooking but doesn't know anything about gardening. So he's ruining the garden. And the eye in there doing the cooking is burning up everything in the kitchen. And this is really our lives. But we are so full of imagination and so full of pride and so full of vanity that we can't see our lives as they actually are. But ask someone else what your life looks like. Someone who looks at you as an interesting stranger and who really starts to see what your life is about. We don't let people too close, do we? Because we know that they'll see the cracks in our makeup, the cracks in our facade. And when they start to see that, well, it's just a matter of time till they start to dislike us or pick us apart, isn't it? This is why marriages don't work. Marriages don't work because people start to see through this false personality that we presented, that we believe in. They start to see through it and they start to pick holes in it and we get crazy about it. We start to defend. Well, what's the best defense? Let me hear it together. Good offense. Right. A good offense is the best defense. So what do we do? We attack them. We start telling them what's wrong with them. We put them on the defensive. It's a brilliant strategy. Or there are some other people. What do they do? They go away. Withdraw further and further and further back into themselves. There are other people who just go somewhere else. Okay, that's fine. They leave. It's called divorce. Or it's called breaking up. Whatever. That's the condition of the world. That's the condition of the world because we, human beings, machines, and we are machines in every way, robots, we run this world. This world is made up of us. And that's why the world is the way it is. So each eye is using the phone in the name of the master and causing all kinds of problems. 
Another question, should we identify with eyes which want to work? Actually, the truth is we shouldn't identify with anything, but we can't help doing that right now. We can't help identifying. We can either identify more or identify less, but we cannot stop identifying. It just isn't possible for us right now. It's like going out there and picking your car up. You can go out there and try to pick your car up, and you may be able to move it so that the shocks go up and down. If you're really strong and you have a really light car, and you go to one end or the other where the motor isn't, and you try and lift it, you may actually be able to get the wheels to come off the ground. You may be able to see a little air between the tires and the pavement. It, it could happen if you're really strong. But you're not going to move that car. You're not going to pick that car up and throw it across the street. Why? You don't have what it takes. You don't have any problem admitting that because that's verifiable. That's something that we'll also, if you, if you say, oh, I can throw my car across the street, we'll all say, fine, let's go in the parking lot right now, throw it across the street. And then when you don't do it, you're going to look like the fool that you actually are. Because anyone who says they can do something they can't do is a fool. It's foolishness, isn't it? We say things we can't do all the time, which makes us fools, because what we're saying is foolish. But we don't know that because we have all of this imagination and pride and vanity that says, well, I can do that, I can do that. And then we never see that we didn't do it. We see that it was somebody else's fault that we didn't do it. Something else stopped us from doing it. But I could have done it. I would have done it had that not happened, had this not happened, had that person not interfered. This is our condition. Not a very bright picture I'm painting here. But it gets better. Don't get, don't get depressed about it. This is the exciting part. If we can see where we really are, this is the beginning of the excitement. If you can see who you really are, then you have a chance of getting out of it. As long as you think you're in Philadelphia, any directions you get to get anywhere else aren't going to get you there because the directions will necessarily be wrong because you're not in Philadelphia. You're in Vista, California. We've got to know where we are before we can start following directions to get out of here. And get out of here is a good idea. Not out of here, Vista, California but out of this condition that we're in, where we have so little control of anything, but we think we have control of everything, until some big disaster strikes, and then we go, ah, my whole life is falling apart. You have any idea how many people I hear about who their husband or their wife gets some internet lover, and they leave. They just, one day they just say, I'm leaving, and they go, and they, and they go meet this person, this internet person, and they live with them. They disappear. And then the wife or the husband who's left goes, I don't know what happened. Everything was fine. We were getting along fine. We were having sex. All the bills were paid. Everything was wonderful. Why did he do this? Why did she do this? I don't get it. We don't know who's over there. We don't know what's going on in their heads. We don't know who's in here. We don't know what's going on in here. This is what self-observation is about. It's about finding out what's really going on in here. Not out there in, in those people, but in here, in this person. So no, we shouldn't identify with anything. But we should go with work, guys, and listen to what they say. There are eyes in you that really want to do this work, that really want to be free, that really want to escape this self-made imaginary prison that we've locked ourselves in, that really want to find our way back home, back to our potential, back to our essential selves, back to our real eyes, back to what we were created to be, back to the possibility that we were created with, that we were meant to manifest, express in fullness. We want to find our way back. There are eyes that want that. Those, that group of eyes we call work eyes. Eyes that are willing to do the work to get back to the aim, to the goal. Go with them. Listen to them. Work eyes become separate from the rest of the eyes in there, and they begin to form deputy steward. Now, deputy steward is what the work calls the beginning of the formation of a group of eyes that can start to get the house in order. They can start to say, okay, you the gardener, you go back out, get out of the kitchen, just turn all that stuff off, get out of the kitchen, go back to the garden. He goes out to the garden, gets the, the cook, and says, okay, now you come back, come back into the, the kitchen and start to fix this up and clean these things up. And then Deputy Steward comes back and he checks. And he makes sure that the gardener's still gardening, the cook's still cooking, and the servant's still serving, and the, and the car wash, the chauffeur's still chauffeuring. Do you get my drift? I don't want to run this into the ground. But I do want you to understand this, because it's important. 
So that's Deputy Steward. This development of consciousness happens through self-observation and it leads to the higher stages of steward. So there's Deputy Steward, then there's Steward, then there's Master. So these are the three stages that the work gives us that we need to develop through or move into as we raise our level of being, as we raise our consciousness. We're really what raising our consciousness means is we expand our consciousness as we become more aware, as we let more light in. Self-observation is what lets the light in. As we let more light in, the light cleans the machine. You don't have to do that. You're not the machine cleaner. You're the person who lets the light in so that the light can do the work, so that the light can cure us, so that the light can heal us, so that the light can cleanse us. That's the purpose of all this. The hard part is letting the light in because there are so many things that want to stop the light. And those are eyes, little personalities that live in the darkness, that live in small, dark corners, little rooms down in the basement. And they don't want anybody messing with their little rat-infested, roach-infested, crusty, dark, dank world. It's dirty down there, but they like it. Have you ever noticed how rats like darkness and dirt? They don't have a problem with it. They prefer it. You give a rat, you give rats a nice, clean space, well-lit, bright, and they will turn it into a sewer. Why? Because that is their nature. These little eyes, these little personalities living inside of us, there are very many of them there's, that are just, that's their nature. They just have a rat-like nature. The deal is that if we nourish the work eyes, they will thrive. If we ignore them, if we don't pay attention to them, they will become feeble, they will become weak, just like you would if you fasted. Don't eat for a while, you start to get a little shaky. First you get hungry, then you don't eat and you don't eat, then you get a little shaky, then your blood sugar starts to drop and your body starts to react, you start to have sensations, and you know it's time to eat. You know that if you don't get something to eat, you're going to kind of like crawl out of your skin and float away. You know the feeling? Now, if you've got a strong determination to fast for a certain amount of time, well, then you just notice those sensations and you say, well, and you let them go. Because you're not paying attention to those signals as these are signals that tell me what I have to do. You look at those signals as, okay, these are the signals that the body is saying it's now beginning to decide, okay, are you going to put anything in the stomach or do I need to start burning calories that are stored in fat? And you say, well, no, you're, we're not going to eat, so you start burning the calories that are stored in the fat. The body says, okay, and it does that. But if you are listening to all of the sensations and going, oh, and panicking, then, you're, oh, I have to eat. If I don't eat, I'll die. Oh, the body's not telling you that. It's just asking a question. These are the sensations. When you know how to interpret the sensations properly, then you can make an intelligent decision about what you want to do. But if you don't know how to interpret the sensations properly, you can't possibly make an intelligent decision about what to do. Can you see that we don't know how to interpret sensations properly? We don't have a clue about the impressions coming in. Somebody walks into the room, oh, he looks menacing. Oh my God, I think he has a gun. Oh, he's going to kill us all. And the next thing you know, all these eyes are insane. And, they're, and they've got you in a panic and you've got all kinds of crazy sensations going on in your body. And the next thing you know, you're doing stupid stuff. So if we nourish the work guys, they get stronger. We don't nourish them, they become weak, and they may even leave us. So no matter how long you've worked at this work, and we've worked at it for years now, if you stop nourishing those work guys, they will get weak and feeble and they may actually leave you. They may, I don't know. I've seen it happen before, or perhaps they just are like seeds and they lie dormant until they can get some more nourishment. I don't know. In my case, that's how it was. They appeared to be seeds that were dormant for a while. When I found this work 35 years ago, I didn't understand it the way I understand it now, but I loved it. I thought, this is it. I knew this was it. I knew it. I could feel it. I could sense it. The cognition of emotions, I could feel it emotionally. It was very powerful, and I was very excited about it. And then life started to pull this way and that way. And those little eyes, they just got scattered or they became, they stopped being nourished so much and so they became weaker and more feeble and they didn't get the chance to do what they're doing now. That's okay. We're back. And that's all that matters. Can eyes be divided into groups of similar eyes? Yes. They inhabit different subdivisions of centers or different rooms in the little house, in this house that we are. They they live in little rooms, so they're different rooms. So this big mansion that the master owns has a lot of different rooms. There are servants' quarters, there are guest quarters, there are master quarters, 
There's the master bedroom, the master bed. There may be a whole floor just for the master and his family. Then there may be a, a whole section just for the servants. So that's the way our house is. It's ordered that way, but it's in this order right now because the master's gone. No one to tell them what their job is to make sure they do it. So the eyes can be divided like that. Small eyes and small subdivisions. They're useful for life, but they can't understand the work. So we have the servants. And you notice that the servants in those old English films, the butler talks in a certain way, but the cook, oh, blimey, what are you borrowing, blah, blah, they talk in another way, and the coachman talks in another way, and the chauffeur talks in another way. And you can see that there are levels, like stratas of society. Right in that house, there are the basically the uneducated, unwashed. They're the lowest on the list. They're out there cleaning up the stables. And then as you move up, the people come in closer to the house, and you get to the head butler, and he's usually somebody who has got it together. He can run things. Then you got the woman who runs the house, that side of it, and she usually is very adept at that. What we have is nobody like that. We need to hire somebody like that or train somebody like that or find somebody like that. But we don't have somebody like that now. So we're just crazy. So that's the story on small eyes and subdivisions. It can be very useful for life. That group of eyes out there cleaning the stables, mucking out the stables, they're very useful for life. That's a necessary thing to do. But you start talking to them about the work and they just go, uh-huh, sure, right. They'll go to sleep. They'll just leave. They'll go out and muck the stables because that's what they do. You talk to the cook about it. Forget it. I don't talk to the guy who does my lawn and garden. I don't talk to him about this work. He doesn't care. He doesn't understand it. And he doesn't want to understand it. What he wants is money. He is so connected through his senses to the external world. He doesn't care that there's an internal world. He's not interested. There are eyes like that in us. Emotional valuation puts us in the presence of bigger eyes. When we have emotional valuation for this work, when you can start to see what this means, when you can start to see the reality of your life, and when you can start to see the possibility of where it could be, you start to get emotional about it. I want that. I, I want to be free from this. And that puts us right immediately in the presence of bigger eyes than the little eyes that just want, oh, I just want to, I just want to get a hamburger. I don't care about anything else. Oh, my, I give my life for a hamburger. Oh, I just die for a piece of bacon. Bacon? <laughs> You know, I just die for a piece of bacon. Is that? It's not real bacon. It's bacon. Just die for a piece of bacon right now. That's insane. But there are little eyes that really think like that. They act like that. And once they get hold of us, we're crazy. We go, I just got to have some bacon. We're out shopping. We don't even know what happened. How did I get to the store? What's going on? I want some bacon. Or she's got this one, this one here, this one here. She's got this grilled cheese sandwich eye. She'll have to be out there at a restaurant chowing down. Give me a big plate of grilled cheese sandwiches. Put them all, pile them up right here. And she'll start picking out on grilled cheese sandwiches. What about your diet? Diet? Oh, my God, this isn't on my diet. How did I get here? Uh, I was aliens in a spaceship. They picked me up. They captured me. They put me in this restaurant. They forced me to eat grilled cheese sandwiches until I gained 100 pounds. Okay. Okay, that's where we're at. That's what we do. Now, of course, all these examples are insane, but they're not so insane when you really see who you are and how you're operating. Then you start to go, oh, oh, oh. then you start to get evaluation for this work. Then you start to say, I want to get out of that insanity. I'd like to stop waking up in the, in the restaurant pigging out. I'd like to stop waking up in the kitchen eating in the middle of the night. I'd like to stop waking up in the bar trying to pick somebody up. I'd like to stop waking up wherever. I'd like to stop that. I like to wake up before I got to that and say no to those eyes. Domestic, social, professional personalities, all that stuff composed of a large number of small eyes are in sections inside of us. And they're triggered by outside events. You go to work, immediately that triggers professional eyes, that whole group. And they come out. Or you go from your office, you're walking somewhere, and you get on the elevator, and you're headed out to the car. And this really groovy looking chick gets on the elevator with you. And all of a sudden, a whole group of eyes start preening and looking and doing all the stuff. You know the stuff. Or, okay, so if you're on the elevator and you happen to be a woman and this really good looking guy walks in and he notices you, then all that goes. You all of a sudden, you'll notice that eyes start controlling your movements. You stand differently, you hold your head differently, your eyes become different, you smile. All this stuff is involuntary. You suck your stomach in. All this stuff is involuntary. 
You're not in control of it. This group of eyes are controlling you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Good. So do you know that this is true? All right. You can see this in yourself. You can see what a moron you are, what an idiot you are. You are a total idiot. We're all idiots. That's just it. And this is why Gurdjieff said, you know, he had the toast to the idiots. We're all idiots. We're just different kinds of idiots. In other words, these are idiosyncrasies. These are the things that, that stamp us and make us do whatever it is we do. And it's idiotic. But it's not idiotic in a horrible negative sense. It's idiotic in as, this is just what we do, people. It's what defines us. You know, you got your John Travolta dancing eyes. Ever notice that? Just play some music and you'll notice that Patty instantly goes into her John Travolta dancing eyes. Her body will start moving and it's the same movements every time. It's exactly the same. I've watched this for years. It's the same movements every time. It is completely, absolutely, thoroughly mechanical. Can she control that? Absolutely not. Why? She doesn't want to. I'm having fun. Oh, oh this is fun. She doesn't want to. But what we're saying is, so she's happy the master's gone. Because then the master's gone, she can go play. Well, what about what it costs? The dancing eyes don't care about cost. They are not interested in that at all. They're only interested in having a good time. What it costs, who cares? Now, the problem is that now, Patty's older now, so those dancing eyes don't get out to go to bars anymore. Why? Well, she got tired of all those other eyes having to clean up after that group. All the responsible eyes that had to pay the bills, whatever comes from that, that had to deal with the aftermath of, let's just have fun, woohoo! When the cat's away, the whole cellar of rats will play. This is what we call regrets. <laughs> That's where regrets come from, people. Remorse and regrets comes from the master was gone, these other idiots got in charge, this house in disorder and just ran riot. And then we're left to clean all this mess up. That's regrets and remorse. So observation begins with noticing the work of the three different centers. Let's take, for example, fidgeting. Now, right now, Steve's knees are fidgeting. His body's fidgeting. And this is something that everybody who knows Steve knows that he does. It's either his foot will be doing this or his knees will be doing that. And that's a completely mechanical action. There's some little eye in moving center, in a very small part of moving center, that's fidgeting. You may notice that. Can fidgeting be an eye? Yes. Usually it's a small eye in moving center, but it can be accompanied by intellectual and emotional fidgeting. Now, if it's in all three centers, moving, intellectual, and emotional, then it's a very powerful eye. If it's just in the moving center, he now he stopped doing it. So he now has become conscious, and he's used a work eye, a group of work eyes, to say, no, you're not allowed to do that. Stop it. And he has stopped it. That's what this work does. It gives you the ability to do. But you don't have the ability to do because you're not conscious. When I pointed it out, a smile came over his face, and he went to work. He took it as a conscious shock and an opportunity. And that's what this work is about. Now, he could have taken it as, he's making me wrong again. He's been doing this to me for years. He's making me look bad. He could have done that. Then he would have gotten emotionalized with that little eye in the moving center. And those two would have teamed up and got intellectual eye involved. And then he would have had a very powerful group doing him a lot of harm, a whole lot of harm. But fortunately, the work eyes were used to put that eye out of its, out of its misery, as it were. Now, it'll be back. He hasn't killed it, but he stopped it because he does have some power there. You're not allowed to do that. That's all. You're dismissed. Go back out to the garden. You're not allowed in the kitchen. Get it? Good. I love it. I love this work. I love what I'm doing. I love my job. I love this system because it works. That's why I love it. It works. If it didn't work and I was just doing this because I needed your money, that would be awful. But you can find awful anywhere. There are whole groups. There are whole religions based on that. People who just do it and say it and has no, they can't do a thing. Oh, yes, well, but when you die and go to heaven, then you'll be able to do it all. Oh, whoopee do. Well, then how come they're not all, you know, punching their tickets right now? If it's all that wonderful. Oh, die and go to heaven. Well, fine. Everybody ought to punch their ticket right now. Get on the bus. You know, it's like a little kid, the Sunday school kid. He goes to Sunday school and the, the pastor says to him, uh, do you want to go to heaven? And the kid goes, no. The pastor goes, what do you mean? You don't want to go to heaven when you die? He says, oh, when I die. I thought you were getting up a busload now. 
You know, it's like, no, I don't want to go to heaven now. Would I die? Oh, yeah, I don't want to go to heaven now. Not now. But see, if it's that great, if this is so awful and that's so great, then why aren't all these people who are teaching this stuff punching their tickets? There's no hope of actually making this better by making yourself better. Then what's the point? Well, just hold on. Just hold on till you die. Oh, forget you. I want it now. I want some control now. I want some freedom now. I want to escape now. I don't want to have to die and go someplace and then magically be free. I've never seen anything like that in life, have you? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. It may not be true. But you decide that for yourself. That's neither here nor there. Here we, we are here now. We're not in Philadelphia. Well, well, if you were in heaven right now, it would be, well, that'd be great, but I'm not. I'm right here right now. And quite frankly, sometimes this can be hell. And I'd like to get out of this. Oh, well, just die, okay? You first. Do you notice they don't? It all changes then. Am I ranting? Yes, that it was a little rant. I apologize. It was some other eyes got my mouth for a minute and they just ranted. Little demons. I'm possessed! So we begin by noticing the work of the three centers. So Steve noticed the work of the moving center. He brought the intellectual center in with some work eyes. And he brought the emotional center in. I don't want this to happen. I had a feeling for this. This is something I can stop. This is something I can work on right now. He brought those eyes to bear on that little eye in the moving center and stopped it. That little eye in the moving center will be back. But he won't be as strong next time because he's had some of his nourishment taken away. He said some of his ration, his rations have been cut. So he doesn't get as much to eat now. So he's not going to be as strong. And the ration that was cut from the little eye got fed to the work eyes. Now they're getting stronger. You dig it? Is this great or what? This is how it works, people. It's a gradual change like that. It's all rations. There's just so much food in the house. There's only so much. And who's going to eat it? It's like a granary. Do you know how much grain rats can eat? Oh, my God. It's incredible. And then they foul a bunch of grain by doing what they do in it. Yeah, what a, eliminating. That's a nice way to say it. Eliminating into it. They eliminate in the food. Ah! The food that, that's what I say, rats are dirty. And we've got little eyes like that, little rat eyes, that'll eliminate right in the food. They don't care. They don't live, they live in the stink and the dark and the filth and they don't care. We've got eyes like that. Let's get out of those eyes and get into bigger eyes. That's what this work is about. Observation begins with noticing the work in the three centers. And Steve was a perfect example of that. Notice that you're intellectually fidgeting and you may notice certain movements as well. So have you ever noticed that you're intellectually fidgeting? What is that? I'm worried about this, worried about that. You may be able to look at the moving center and see that there are certain movements that go along with that. Maybe you do this with your head when you start intellectually fidgeting. Uh, maybe you do this with your shoulder when you start intellectually fidgeting. Maybe you do this. Maybe you pull your hair out like this. I don't know what you do when you begin to intellectually fidget, but you could observe yourself and find out. And then, if you can observe yourself and find out, eventually you may be able to stop it. Maybe not for a long time, but maybe just for a second. You can just stop it when you're conscious of it right now. You have taken away some of its food ration and you've given it to work eyes. They get stronger, it gets weaker. Yeah, baby, that's what I'm talking about. Are all eyes acquired? Yes, usually through imitation and education, and they belong to personality which is acquired. So yes, all eyes are acquired. All eyes are acquired. Well, what about real eye? You got to ask yourself that. You didn't ask yourself that. You know why you didn't ask yourself that? I'm ahead of you. I prepared this yesterday, so I had to think this through. But you're just starting to think about it right now. So I've got the advantage, which I'm going to keep and press for your benefit as well as for mine. Real eye is not acquired. It's there as a possibility from birth. We don't make real eye. We seek to approach real eye, and then we know who we really are. That's the whole thing, in a nutshell. It's really beautiful. Are there eyes in essence? Tell me, are there eyes in essence? Yes, tell me. Well, there are work eyes. Yes, there are work eyes. Where are they? They're in personality. Yeah. Right. So are there eyes in essence? Is essence acquired? No. Are there eyes in essence? No. Right. Just learn how to think. You have all the answers. You just need to learn how to think and put them together. If you back up far enough, you can see it's all very clear. All eyes are acquired. All eyes are acquired. They're in personality. Personality is acquired. Are there eyes in essence? No, there can't be. Why? Because essence is not personality. I got it now. It's cool, isn't it? Some eyes that we acquire are very close to essence. 
we have eyes in us that are more essential eyes and eyes in us that are very far from essence. As a little child, you were very kind and loving. Let's say your essence was just very kind and loving. You would go up and you'd just see some other little kid. You'd pick him up and hug him. Oh, and you were just so open and, and fresh and pure and loving and giving. And then your father said, don't do that. You shouldn't touch other boys like that. Because your father was afraid you'd come out a homosexual. You'd turn into a homosexual. Because his father was afraid that he was going to be a homosexual or whatever. You start to think, oh my God, that's bad, that's bad, that's wrong. So those eyes, that essence then is now covered by eyes that protect it. So father yells at you for touching other boys. Even though you had no clue. You're a little kid, you're three years old, two years old. You have no clue what he's talking about. Sex. What does that mean to a two-year-old? But it means a lot to the parent who's teaching the child this through their own fears. And so the child then starts to develop, acquire eyes that say, no, don't touch other boys. No, don't do that. No, it's not right to hug other people. It's not right to touch other people. It's not right to love other people. You get how ugly this is getting, where this goes? That's how it starts. We acquire those eyes, and they are very far from essence. But we have other eyes that are close to essence, that want to touch, that want to love, that want to do, that want to share, that want to understand, that don't want to fight and argue about everything. But we have other eyes that are far from that. So you can see there are concentric circles of eyes. Further out there you go toward the world, the harsher the eyes usually are. The closer you get into essence, closer to essence, the softer the eyes will be. Suppose that we have some useful eyes, but they act in wrong ways, for the, they act in, for the wrong reasons. So useful eyes, eyes that are generous, eyes that are kind, eyes that are pleasant, eyes that are social, eyes that are friendly, eyes that are helpful, but they always act for the wrong reason. They act to be seen by men. They act so that we can be proud of ourselves. They act so that we can go oh, strut around and, oh, I'm such a generous person. I'm such a big giver. Oh, I'm such a big spender and I'm really a wonderful person. And they feed vanity and pride and make us this bloated, stinking mess of a human being that we all can't stand. A phony who uses other people to get what they want. What if we've got eyes like that that know how to spread the love, but they do it all for the wrong reason. What do we do about that? Can they be taught to act through the work for the right reasons? Then would they become essentialized? Personality must be formed. It has to be formed. And it may be formed either better or worse. Look, there are good personalities and bad personalities in the world, right? Charles Manson has a personality. Mother Teresa had a personality. One was a good personality, one was a bad personality. Nobody likes to hear that about themselves. We don't like to hear the truth about ourselves. If I'm going to tell you the truth, I have to kiss you first. There's a certain ritual I have to go through to tell you the truth. Because you're not going to tolerate straight truth. We're not tolerant of straight truth. We have to have the kissy, kissy, kissy truth. Give me kissy, kissy, kissy truth. Give me kissy, kissy truth. Okay, here it comes. You're really okay. You just need a little work. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Oh, yes, that's nice. I like that. There's good training and there's good discipline that is needed in life. If you were well trained, you had parents that trained you well in certain areas and disciplined you well in certain areas, those things benefit you now. If you have education that did not do that, look at where was Charles Manson raised? Who raised Charles Manson? Does anyone know? Okay, let me tell you who raised Charles Manson. The system. The system raised Charles Manson. He was fatherless. So there was no man to raise him. He hated his mother, and he was in the system from the time he was a kid. He started as a juvenile delinquent in the system, and he spent his whole life in the system. And where is he now? In the system. And where does he want to be? In the system. Why? Because every time he was out of the system, he got out here, and he didn't know how to handle this world, so he tried to get back in the system. And when we put him back in the system, he says, you think you're punishing me. You're just sending me home, baby. This is where I live. This is what I know. This is what I love. You want to punish me, put me back out in the world. That's sad. But that's what the system does. Why does the system do that? Because we're in it. Because we made up the system and we're crazy. We don't do what works. We do whatever we think is right in the moment. Whatever I is running the show right now. Whatever I is using the master's telephone. Don't get me wrong, I'm not weeping for Charles Manson. I'm weeping for all of humanity because we are all in the same boat. And if you don't weep for humanity, well, then you need to develop some compassion. And you can do that. It can be done. 
and this work will help you to do that. I could talk a lot more about all this stuff, but we're out of time. So if you've got these eyes that are useful in life, but they're doing it all for the wrong reason, the work can train them and lift them up, as it were. can lift them up into a better place so that they start to work for the right reasons. And then those eyes become useful, and they move closer to essence. Useful life eyes can be trained to do the work, and the work will train them. So they're really mechanical in life. But when the work gets hold of them and trains them, then they become more conscious because then they're used more consciously. You have a choice. When you're conscious, you have a choice. When you're unconscious, you have no choice. Steve had no choice about his knees moving until I made him conscious of it or gave him the opportunity to become conscious of it. He could have blocked that, but he didn't. That's the work in action. Next question is, is essence the seed from which real I can grow? And it's really better to say that behind essence lies real I. And through the development of essence, we contact real I. The object of the work is to become more real, to get rid of false, unreal eyes. Everyone is created perfect, that is, with real I. But we descend into the world, literally and psychologically, and we lose our way. Is real I the individual limit of the potential development for each of us? Yes. It's the ultimate reality that we can attain. Behind real I lies God. And that question is incredibly formatory. We're so far from real I that it's just blither right now. It's just philosophy. It's all theory right now. But that doesn't matter. We can still answer the question. We just have to put it where it belongs. Put that question where it belongs in philosophy. It's the philosophy of the work. It's the theory of the work. It's not the work practice because you're not there. And you're not likely to get there in the not too distant future. We're individual creations. So then if that's true, then real I can't be the same in everybody. See, and that's really what that question is saying. Like there's this real I. Well, then what happens to our individuality? Well, then there is no individuality. If you get to real I, you lose your individuality. But that's not the way it is. You were created individually. Therefore, real I is individually different. Let me explain that. The problem is that we imitate others. Snowflakes are different in the form of their crystallization, but they all share the same hexagonal pattern of snow crystal. Each and every one of them is different. So each and every one of us is different in real eye, whatever that is. But each and every one being different shares a huge amount of the same thing. By true self-observation, we let a ray of light into ourselves. The light of consciousness, which the work increases beyond everything and anything that we can presently imagine. Someday you will see yourself at a glance and you'll see everything going on in every center all at the same time. Those of you who have been meditating for a while, let me put it to you in a different way, something that you will be able to grasp because you've had the experience. There are times when you're meditating, when you sweep through your body, you can feel the whole body all at once, every single part of it. Now, that's not often, but it happens. What we're talking about is in consciousness, being able to see, getting to the place in consciousness where you can see everything about you and everything that's going on in every center all the time right now. You can just, at a glance, see it all. Cool, huh? That's what this work is for. Now, someday we'll be able to say, with that tiny little psychic lady from Poltergeist, this house is clean. 